hey, it works. So, hey, for those of you watching on YouTube, those of you watching on Twitch right now, welcome. This is part two. We're going to do some more Active Directory hacking on the Throwback Network through Try Hack Me. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, just know that you should join us live sometime on Twitch. I stream most nights from 1030 to midnight Central Time. And uh, it's interactive, so you can follow along. Uh, what happened last time is one of the viewers, Nate, who's actually my friend in real life, uh, corrected me on some things, and that's, that's super helpful to work through this stuff together. I make no claim to be an expert or even to know what I am doing. I am doing this because I need to learn Active Directory hacking better than I do, and hopefully you are watching because of that, or maybe you're following alongside of me. So let me go ahead and share my screen. You should be seeing my desktop now. I do have Windows 11. I know for some of you that makes you sick and that's okay. Um, I have no idea what Nobu was talking about, but cool, man. <laughs> All right, so if you guys want to follow along, let me show you, um, try hack me real quick. Let's close out Facebook. Let me pull up a new tab. And go here, and I'll show you guys what we're going to be working on today through Try Hack Me. If you do want to purchase it sometime, if you've never been on Try Hack Me, it's an incredible platform that teaches hands on ethical hacking. Uh, there's two kind of tiers there's a free tier and a premium tier. I have the premium tier, and I recommend it. But what we're doing is the Throwback Network. So it's an Active Directory Lab that teaches the fundamentals and core concepts of attacking a Windows network. It does cost money. Even if you're subscribed to Try Hack Me, I believe it's $60 for 30 days of lab time. But it had really good reviews when I was looking through stuff on Reddit. So that's what we are going through today. I'm not going to recap everything we did last week. Um, I'll just run through, or not last week, <laughs> yesterday. That wasn't that long ago. But if you look at this, this is a what, what makes this different than normal try hack me is normal try hack me. You have one computer or machine you're trying to hack. This is an entire network, and there's three public facing computers that we were able to discover. We have the mail server here, we have a production server here, and we have the firewall. And where we left things off last night is we were able to do a PHP shell, and we got uh, root access on the firewall. That's where we're going to pick things up today. So let's go ahead and boot up Kali Linux. I use uh, Oracle VirtualBox. You can use VMware or whatever is convenient for you. If this makes no sense to you, it, it, it's actually a lot easier to install than you think it is. If you just Google Kali Linux VirtualBox, I believe you can actually download a .ova file, which will bring it straight into VirtualBox. Oh, we're restoring the virtual machine. I must not have fully shut it down. Oh, well, that works. And we're going to jump back into things. And if uh, at any time the audio or the stream sounds off, go ahead and just shout it out in the chat. Uh, last night we had no issues. I'm hoping we're going to have the same here. I'm just going to close all my tabs. Let's just, let's just start fresh. Close everything out. And uh, the first thing you need to do if you're doing it through Try Hack Me is connect to the open VPN. And what I learned yesterday is the network VPN is different than the normal VPN. You have to actually re-download the configuration file. I realized that when my um, shells weren't working. Or I think I couldn't in-map stuff if I remember right. I just turned up my lighting. I think my face is almost too dark. And now, the most important part, if you are joining me, you got to put your hood up because you're not a real hacker until... You put your hoodie up. If you don't have a hoodie on, I you can't even continue. Go find a hoodie. And you, you also need to turn off your lights. That's another requirement to be a true hacker. If you have one of those anonymous masks, you might as well just put it on as well. I think those give you superpowers. Um, let me change over to root. Go to my download file. Actually, I'm taking my hoodie off because it's annoying my head. So I'll probably fail today since I don't have my hoodie on. LS, and if you download... Uh, throwback. So if you're doing throwback with us, it'll be your try hack me username dash throwback. That'll be the access or configuration file you're going to download. We're just going to use open VPN to connect to it. My name on try hack me is tenebrae. It is Latin for darkness, which I think fits the fact that it is dark every time I am working or doing a stream. It probably fits. I don't know what that says about me, but it is what it is. Let's go ahead and get connected to the VPN. Let's name that tab VPN. And let's just switch over to root. 
not a requirement and actually best practice isn't to do everything in root but um it is what it is i made a directory for this uh i believe this oh that was the guest creds that we found cd nmap these are the different in-map things that we did. So in-map is the first part of doing any type of ethical hacking. That's just doing the scanning. So let's go ahead and jump back out here. And let's, I, I bet the IPs change. So I'm going to pull up this. And let's just compare IPs to make sure we're not doing anything. Because I saved these last time to my Etsy host file. I think that's 34. Is that 36? It's really small. Hold up. Oh, 34. Maybe the IPs are the same. That'd be helpful. Let's go ahead and try to try to ping like prod.thm. Oh, 34, 30. Oh, the IPs did change. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is edit my Etsy host file and just get the correct IPs in here. So prod was 34.232. Let's do that. Mail was... 34.219 and the firewall is 34.138 I think that might still be the same all right now just for sanity before we confuse ourselves let's go ahead and try to ping that um, maybe I should check my VPN let me just try to ping it by the IP. I might be typing the IP wrong. So it's 10.200.34.232. Let's just try to ping it that way. Okay, I'm I'm obviously doing it wrong in my Etsy host file. We're just getting started and my fatigue is already hitting me. <laughs> okay, let's check our mail server. 200.34.232. Uh, right here. Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. 34, so 10.200.34.232. Production is 10.200.34.219. And the firewall was 10.200.34.138. Let's try that now. So if we ping mail.thm, there we go. And if we ping prod.thm, there we go and ping firewall.thm uh, oh my goodness okay now we're in business perfect let's go ahead and jump back to the firewall because the first thing we need to do probably is get that shell back so we're going to do a reverse shell i explained it in my last video what that is but essentially we are getting a connection to the firewall almost like an ssh connection for lack of a better description where we have terminal or command line connection to it and our initial attack vector if you remember right was the firewall had default credentials which is actually a pretty common vulnerability that companies don't change the default creds and then attackers can utilize those to get access to it so let's go to firewall.thm I might need the HTTP, I don't know. I think it might just Google search it if I don't do that, at least with Firefox. And if I remember right, it's admin and the default password is pfsense, I think. Perfect, and then this is where, like this is at the end of the night and um, I stared at this thing forever to find the command prompt right here. Like, I don't know, Nate probably can attest to this. I don't know how long I was looking, like literally looking at this and I didn't see it. But command prompt is gonna allow you to run uh, PHP commands on it. So then we're able to pop a PHP reverse shell. So we'll get that pulled up. And I believe Pentest Monkey is the one that we used last time, which is just a sweet name, Pentest Monkey. Let's just let's just grab the raw one there. Come on. Let's let's do this thing. Apparently the network feels like being slow to me. But that's okay. In the meantime, we can set up our netcat listener. So to do a shell, you have to be able to catch the shell. Um, let's first just check our IP. So it's at 10.51.31.68. We're just gonna leave that one up. I'll go here. We'll call this shell. Switch over to root, netcat, mvlp, and then you're just specifying the port that you're listening on. And because I'm leet, 
Uh, we're going to use 1337. I know some people still don't know what that means. Um, Nate said it was fun to watch. I was screaming at my screen. It's right there. Click it. <laughs> That's fun. All right, let's go ahead and do this. We got it listening on port 1337. Okay, let's just try this again. I don't know why it didn't pull up. Hey, Nate, is yours working okay? Maybe after like restart mine or reset the network or something. This should cause it to come up. Oh, you haven't started? Go ahead and start. <laughs> Should let me know if it's working for you or not. Um, because obviously I have connection. Unless did I did I somehow lose connection? Nope. I'm still able to ping it, but obviously it's not loading at all. Oh, why is it trying to do HTTPS? It's trying to go through the wrong port, I think. It's port 80 is where the web server is on, I think, right? Yeah, I don't... For some reason, when I clicked the link, it was trying to... Oh, it is HTTPS. I don't know. I got it working now. Whatever. That's all that matters. So here is our PHP shell. Now, this is meant to run PHP. So if you try it like this, you're going to get a syntax error. You can just delete that. We don't need that PHP tag in the beginning. And then it kind of walks us through where we need to put our IP and our port. So if you remember, our port is going to be 1337. That's the port that we set. Our IP, and this is different than like, usually my try hack me IP is this 10.13.10.98 even has it up there. So when I was first doing this, it wasn't popping the shell because I have a different IP for the throwback network. So if you're following along or maybe you're watching this as a walkthrough on YouTube and that's the issue you're having. And that's why you're having the issue. So we got that down. Let's just double check that we got our netcat shell running on 1337. We have all this. Let's go ahead and execute. All right, who am I? And we now have root access to the firewall. So let's go ahead and jump back to try hack me and dive into it. I guess I didn't even look at these flags. Oh, there's a flag in the guest inbox. These are some flags we can go back to and look at. What is the root flag? What is the log flag? I wonder if it's gonna walk us through that stuff or if I'm just supposed to find it because I'm guessing this is where the root flag is. Am I losing connection again? Throwback network is, is failing me. My shell seemed to have lost some type of connection, but I think it's something is, is bugging out right now about this throwback network. It's not working properly. If it keeps doing this, I might just reset the VPN, and that's always a good thing to try if you're having issues on, on Try Hack Me is just reconnect, reset the VPN, see if you can reset the network. Uh, Nate, now that you're on, let me know, are you having similar issues? I'm going to try to catch that shell again. Maybe something went wrong with the shell itself. Still working on getting your notes pulled up. <laughs> Something is bugged out. So I think since we're both on the network, we might be able to vote to reset it. Um, let me just see if I can get shell or not. Otherwise, I'm gonna see if I can get this network to reset because I'm pretty sure it's not working properly. I can't get any of it to load. Come on, try hack me. You guys are, I, I hype you guys up and now you're making yourselves look bad. Hey, Nate, if you have the network open, can you, can you vote reset as well? I wonder if both of us voting can reset the network.
exit out of my VPN. Just make sure it's not running anymore. Yeah, we're good. Mine is not loading too. Yeah, dude, um, something is wrong right now with the throwback network. I just voted. I don't know what this thing is doing. Um, hmm. We might just be choosing a different box for tonight if the throwback network isn't going to work. I'm going to have to yell at try hack me. I'm going to try to reconnect to the VPN one more time. And just see if I can get, get anything to work. I could re-download my configuration file too. Um, I'm just going to try to reconnect first if this doesn't work and it doesn't reset automatically. I may try to re-download my configuration file. Yeah, mine was loading like off and on and I even got shell access in the firewall and then it just stopped, everything just stopped responding. Um, so it seems like an intermittent issue. Yeah, I think we're on different networks as well. So yours might be working while mine might be broken. See, I can't even, I can't ping right now. It should, ping should be working. I have like a bad connection. Because the IP obviously didn't change. Well, I'm glad it worked yesterday when I went through a bunch of the stuff, but this is frustrating. I have no connection to this stuff. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to completely shut down my VM and see if I can get it working. I'm going to spend this entire like study time from 10.30 to midnight <laughs> troubleshooting this dumb VM. Actually, I don't think it's my VM. I'm pretty sure it's the Try Hack Me Network. Something seems to be buggy. Let's see if I can get it to work. Yeah, power off the machine, Oracle. Pop open virtual box. Let's see if we can boot into Cali. The only thing that was different is for some reason my box didn't fully shut down. Turn to a save state, which I don't think I set it to do that. So unless that somehow bugged it out, that's the only thing I can think of that would be different than how I normally do it. I don't, I, I think I've had this issue like once with try hack me in the past, however, like two years. So I'll just see if doing this full restart does it, you know, working in IT support. Usually you restart it first. See if that fixes your problem. All right. Let's try this again. Oh. I should probably navigate to the right folder. Give that a second. Can I ping firewall.thm? Maybe that's all I needed. Look, I'm pinging right away now. I wonder if it was just the save state that really I don't know why that would throw it off um, since I closed everything out, reconnected the VPN, but it seems to be working now. I'm going to try to recatch that shell and we will dive back into things. So we'll set that up, open up Firefox. He's yelling no, so I don't know why he's yelling no, but okay. Yeah, it's working a billion times better now. I think we're good. I, that must have been what it is. So note to self, completely restart your VM before diving into the throwback network. Otherwise, you may have some issues. So let's just redo this process. 
And this is all part of learning, right? Just troubleshooting when you have issues and figuring out why those issues are happening and how you can stop the issues from happening for next time. I don't remember what my IP is on here. I had my other one memorized, but this one I don't quite have memorized yet. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and do our 1337 port and execute. God, did I do something wrong? Oh, that's, I don't know if that space will throw it off. Let's just try this again. I wonder if you could do it with a shell command as well. Um, I could always mess with that if I feel like it. Okay, let's try this now. There we go. Should just grab these flags while I'm here. Uh, I don't know, Nate, if you looked at the flag panel. I don't know if we're supposed to be grabbing flags or if it's gonna walk us through that, but I noticed there's some flags that we should have already grabbed, like from the mail server when we're looking at that, and the root flag for the firewall. So I'm just gonna see if I can grab some of these flags while we're doing it. Um, the log flag, I don't know if it's just that, no. I don't even know where the logs are stored for the PF sense type stuff or if it's the same spot as normal. Oh, well, we'll just kind of keep our eye on this. So there's just two flags for firewall. There's those two flags for mail. I'm going to go back to those flags if it doesn't cover it here. But let's dive back into the course. We've identified a potential attack surface. Oh, so this is just doing a shell. We've already done that. I wonder how they did it. Oh, so they use the same exact shell. They pasted in. So they did everything that I did. I just didn't follow um, through that. What log file was found that is not a default log? What user was found within the log? What is the hash of the user? Okay. Is it talking about like the PF? Okay, there it is. So let's go to CD var log ls. There's our flag right there. Let's go ahead and throw that over on our flag submission panel. Grab that guy. All right. I think those are the two flags for the firewall. Let's jump back to first contact. What, what log file was found that is not a default log? Well, Is it just flag.txt? No, that's not the log file. I don't even know enough about <laughs> log files to tell you what is not a default log. Oh, apparently login.log. Okay, so what user is found in the log, let's go ahead and cat login.log. Last login, oh, and then we have a password hash, so we can do some hash cracking. That sounds like fun. So it was Humphrey W. And um, we would want to take note of that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this. Jump over here. I'm gonna switch to root. And we'll go to throwback and make directory firewall, CD firewall. And I'm just gonna echo that so we have it. And we'll call it like hump free HumphreyWCreds.txt. Let's make sure it went in good. There we go, we have that. What is the hash of the user? Oh, I see, so there's it's asking us to submit flags. So eventually it will tell us to submit the flags. Okay, let's keep going. Wait, just you mean, just you mean, just one this time? Wait, just, whatever. The only service that you have left to attack 
is the mail server. Your team has suggested that you try to password spray using the contact list from the guest accounts as well as sending phishing emails to the users in the contact list. I bet we are going to be using Burp Suite to do that is going to be my guess. Burp Suite is a good tool for um, web hacking type things. We don't really need the, the firewall open anymore. I noticed there were some SSH configs on there. I, if there's credential reuse, we might be able to possibly use SSH creds um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see if that, if it leads us that pathway, but that's something if you do find, um, SSH credentials or a private key or whatever on a server, if people don't change their password, which we all know that you're supposed to use a different password for each account. Most people don't. And then you can, if you compromise them on one system, you might be able to also compromise them on another system. Just a good practice to keep in mind why you should change your password for every account that you have and not reuse your passwords because if one account is compromised, the rest are gonna be compromised. So let's go ahead and go to the mail server. And if you remember, you can log in as a guest user. And so that's TBH guest and welcome TBH one that. Okay, let's just, before we do other things, let's just kind of look around here. Let's see what we all have. Hello guests, welcome to Throwback's guest email account. This account is meant to be used for any guests that happen to visit that need email access in their time visiting. Keep in mind, everything you send is not private and can potentially be viewed by anyone, including me. Please be careful what you do with this account. Sweet, looks like we have a flag. Let's just, while we're in here, let's grab that flag and throw it here. What flag is found in the guest contacts page? Well, let's just let's just go through each one of these. So if we compose, so we can send emails. So maybe you know if there's a real environment, we can do a phishing attack. And here, look at that. We have account names. These are probably account names obviously used in Active Directory. We have a flag here. Let's go ahead and copy that. Submit that. We got all the flags from there. Now let's jump back to this. We're going to do a brute force attack with the usernames that are found here. At least that's what it sounds like, our password spraying. Password spraying is using one password. So it's different than brute force. You're switching out the username each time, but you're using one password that you found, a compromised password that you know is compromised. Password spraying is using one password to attempt to log into a list of users, typically with a common weak password. There are many tools to automate. You can easily test an environment, blah, blah, blah. In a realistic environment, humans are the weakest link. And that is huge, right? So even if you protect, if you have the best like layer seven firewalls in your environment, you have everything configured properly. If you have uh, humans, which I think all companies have humans, they're always the greatest vulnerability. The greatest vulnerability is the human vulnerability, which is why Good training for your employees is vital. Training that is not extremely boring and training that actually helps. Know Before is a company I've used in the past at different places I've worked um, by Kevin Mitnick. And if anyone knows hacking, it is that dude. I believe his title is Hacker in Chief. So one company to look into is Know Before if you're looking into cyber cybersecurity awareness training. All right, if the environment has a weak password policy, <clears throat> then oftentimes... You can spray for common weak password based upon various conditions of the year. For example, if the year was 2020 and the season was fall, then a common weak password that you could spray for would be fall 2020, which a lot of users do that. Some examples of weak passwords, it's giving us some ideas. If your password is in this list, um, go ahead and stop watching and go change your password, right? There's my free cybersecurity advice for you. Finding the attack surface. The attack surface for password spraying is fairly broad. All you need is a field to submit a username and a password. And we can we can actually capture that login with Burp Suite and send it to, um, oh, Repeater. Repeater is what I'm thinking of. I believe Repeater is what we're going to send it to. And then we can repeat the request. There's also, oh gosh, going off memory. There's another Burp, Burp Suite module for attacking, you can set like pitchfork and different things like that. So we'll, we'll dig into Burp Suite. You'll see more about that. Even if there is not a login portal, you can still sometimes password spray against it. For example, we can password spray Active Directory users with Kerbroot. Having a broad attack surface makes password spraying a commonly used attack vector in many red team engagements. 
The only hard part about finding our attack surface is finding the parameters of the request. That's where Burp Suite's gonna probably come in handy. This can either be done by submitting a test login and seeing what the parameters are, because uh, you can also use Hydra, right? If you get the right parameters, Hydra is uh, faster, a little more complex because it's all command line. However, this does not always work. So instead, what we can do is use Burp, I was right, to intercept our request and see what the request parameters are. All right. Well, let's go ahead and open Burp Suite. And the proper way to do Burp Suite is to configure Foxy Proxy, which you can do in Firefox, which is a proxy that routes everything through Burp Suite so you can capture those connections. I recently reinstalled Kali Linux and it doesn't appear that I have installed Burp Suite or installed Foxy Proxy. So uh, Burp Suite also has a built-in web browser. And uh, we'll just use that. It, it'll, it'll do the same thing. Blah, blah, blah. Come on, burp sweet. Oh, I can hear my computer singing to me. Uh, not singing, but playing as fan. Yes, I accept. I don't think I've even launched a burp suite on this instance of Kali Linux yet. You can just, I should be explaining what I'm doing. So we're gonna do a temporary project and burp suite has two uh, kind of additions. Community edition is the free version of Burp Suite, but you're rate limited on certain things such as password spraying, brute force attacks, and there's uh, Extender, which is built into Burp Suite, which are essentially modules that you can install that extend the functionality of Burp Suite. And with the Community Edition, you're limited on some of the extenders you can download. Uh, but the Community Edition is still pretty powerful, and once again, it's free. If you have Kali Linux, it comes pre-installed on there. Um, Z attack proxy. Yeah, dude. So I've heard about that a lot. I've never actually used Z attacks, Z attack proxy. I should, I should check that out. And yeah, what up Hunter bot? I'm assuming you're not a real bot since you said zap gang. Um, I should look into that more Z attack proxy. So I'm taking that's free. Is it, how similar is it to burp suite? And like, is it not rate limited like burp suite when you try to do stuff? I'll let you guys answer that in the chat and then I'll share it in the video for those on YouTube so they can look into it as well. For now, we will use Burp Suite. We can just use the Burp defaults. Um, Burp Suite also has some training that you can attend online. And I'm trying, I don't think there's any discounts for the Burp Suite Professional Edition. I was hoping I get like a student discount with my .edu email. I don't think that was possible. You can get a free trial of Burp Suite Professional or if you work at a security company, often they'll pay for a license with you. So on Z attack proxy, nobody Nate said not limited, quite a bit different than burp, but good online documentation. And Hunterbot said not rate limited, better than burp, but not better than burp pro. Okay, cool. I'll have to look into that just in my own time, maybe in one of my Twitch streams, I'll do my own digging and troubleshooting on that. And hey, Hunter, I'm just curious, are you following along on the throwback network? If you are, feel free to correct me when I do stuff wrong. Even if you're not, feel free to correct me when I do stuff wrong <laughs> as you're watching me. I've noticed when I stream, as the time goes on, and it's a mixture of like, I'm trying to do this while talking, while communicating the entire time, it's hard for my brain to work in all those different ways, so I miss like obvious things, I feel like, when I'm streaming. Okay, so... What we are going to do, when you first open Burp Suite, it, it looks more confusing than it really is. Proxy is what we want to do. Now, if you have Foxy Proxy, which is the ideal way to do it, this is kind of where you configure it. But if you don't, which we don't have it right now, um, we can also use Burp's embedded browser. And at least for what we're doing it right now on this, it should accomplish the same thing. So we need to connect to the mail server. And I saved in my Etsy hosts. Okay, cool. You're at work doing RMF stuff. Sweet. Well, if you while you're listening, if I say something silly, jump in the chat and tell me I'm silly. And so you'll notice when I try to connect to that, it's going to capture every HTTP request. We're doing a GET request here. And to keep going, this isn't of interest to us, at least not right now. We'll forward. Now we're getting the login.php page. We'll forward that request. This is just all the different style things that's forward through that. And now we should be able to jump here. So what we're gonna do here is really any garbage username and password um, here. So we could do, gosh, I didn't even look at what the usernames were. Do I still have it open?
So we know that one of the usernames is going to be Humphrey W. Uh, we actually have his password hash. Now, what do you want, bro? Leave me alone. We have his password hash, so we might even be able to crack his password hash if we took it that route and log in as him. But let's just, for this, it, it really doesn't matter. You can use any username that you want here. We'll do that, and we'll do, you know, super secure password for our password. And hit login, and you'll notice it's going to jump right back to Burp Suite. And here's what we want. We want to be able to modify these fields, the username field and the secret key field is we what we want to be able to modify. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're not going to forward this. Um, if we go, is it action? Yeah, here's what we want to do. We're likely going to send this to either repeater or intruder. I don't remember which one it is. In our password spray, you'll need a list of users. You can get the contact list from the guest account and utilize the names from it. So we can, okay, let's back up. Oh, we're gonna use Hydra. Okay, cool. We need to send a request to Burp with dummy data in the user and password fields to identify where the request parameters are, which is exactly what we did. Here's our request parameters. We can now use these parameters in Hydra, which I mentioned earlier as I was walking through this, to make requests to the website with a user list and a password. Hydra is not rate limited. I bet that's why we're using Hydra. You could do this in Burp Suite, but it's gonna take longer. Hydra is powerful. In order to password spray, you will need a list of users. You can get the contact list from the guest account and utilize the names from it as a user list. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's open back up our mail here. And we have um, all these users right here. So the actual login, I'm trying to remember when we logged in. We didn't specify at throwback.local. So it's just like this, this stuff right here is going to be the login account. So if we just copy something like that, if I open notepad, um, you'll see kind of what we're gonna be doing here. Um, if I do Excel in, 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 um, in the terminal, you can do a delimiter and then you can grab this down I was trying to open mail.thm. You can do a delimiter also in the terminal, like if you create a text file, and then you can make the delimiter spaces, and then you could also pull it down that way just to get these usernames out. So, you know, there's different ways to skin a cat, as they say. Uh, I'm just trying to get my try hack me machine pulled back up. All right, so let's go ahead and open our terminal back up. I thought I already had the, oh, let's check over here. Okay, let's open our terminal back up and oh, we lost connection to the firewall, that's fine. Let's see, D to throwback. I, do I already have a mail folder? I do. And let's G edit, uh, we'll just call it users.txt. And we'll copy in those users. No reply, we probably don't need that in there. That all looks good. Save ls less cat users dot text all of that looks good so we now have our user list for password spraying and users dot text hydra is typically used as a web application login portal brute force tool however it can also be used to password spray against a login portal you only have to supply the ip which we have of course the password and a user list a password list is optional. However, you can make a small list of common passwords within the company and use it to spray with. So let's go back to our common passwords up here. Obviously, if we were doing this, we'd probably want a little bit bigger of a dictionary list, but let's gedit passwords.txt. Oh, come on. And let's just fix some of this formatting. There's probably a way quicker way to do this rather than manually, but um, company is throwback, right? Oh no, that's the name of the network. Is the company name throwback as well? I'm trying to remember from, I'll just check. I'm pretty sure it is, but 
throwback hacks and their domains throwback. So we're just going to try throwback as the password. I don't want that one. Uh, so, oh, we already did that. We can close that out. Where did my... Did I put them all in there? Okay, cool. So we got a password list and we have a user list. Perfect. Let's scroll back down. Um, Hydra is typically used, blah, blah. So it's giving us this here. If you don't know what it is, usually you can do a dash H for help and it's gonna give you an example. And that's for most commands that you're gonna do, honestly, on both Windows and Linux. Uh, that's how you're gonna access some of the help docs there. So it's giving us the examples right here and how we can do it. We're also giving it over here. So let's just go ahead and go through this. So we're gonna do Hydra dash L, which must mean for some reason like the user list or let's just see what dash L. Oh, login. We're using a capital L. Is a capital L different? I think it should be a lowercase L. Oh well. We'll try a capital L just because it's in the example first. Maybe it doesn't matter, but usually it does. Um, users.txt dash P what do we call our password file? Just passwords.txt? I should just, let me just ls real quick. Let me verify that. Oh, thank you, Nate. So what Nate just said in the chat is lowercase l is for string user. And then a capital L is for user list. And we want the user list. Did I just missed that. Oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> Look, it's in the example right there. It just wasn't in the switches above. Um, P... Uh, so dash P is the same lowercase P small for string big for file. Okay, cool. Thank you for that info. So what it's giving us right here, uh, lowercase P, we're going to do capital P because we want to specify our passwords.txt file. So we'll do Hydra dash L and then users.txt dash capital P passwords.txt the machine IP, I think I can just do my mail.thm and it will resolve to the IP. I may have to actually specify the IP, but we'll see if this works first. HTTP post form source redirect.php and then the user parameter. We can get that from, where did burp suite go? I had Burp Suite open, right? Yeah, here it is. Uh, here's Burp Suite. Well, where's, there it is. I think when it was minimized, I didn't see it or I'm just blind. So we have the password parameter or the login parameter there. Um, when I make this, oh, let me open the right window. Oh, <laughs> I specified the wrong thing. Let's, how about click Kali Linux? That'd be a good start. Oh yeah, it did kind of cut off some of it when it's minimized like that. Maybe that's why I didn't see it. So you'll notice that we have HTTP post form, redirect.hp, the user parameter, and then we're going to do user. So our user parameter is right there. Let's just copy that jump back to our terminal which I, I can't I can't get to what if I go like this I do have like two monitors but you guys are on my other monitor <laughs> which is the issue I'm running into right now so we have the redirect.php the user parameter that and we're gonna do user and the password parameter. So let's jump back to burp suite and that's gonna be that secret key. So let's grab that. Uh, 
f equals incorrect. So that must be fail dash v for verbose. Okay, so it resolved the address. We even see that in the verbose. So we didn't have to specify the IP per se. All right, if you successfully pass your spray, you will now have a user account or two that you have fully compromised, allowing you to view company emails and potentially gain further access into the network. What is the username parameter in the post request? So let's just go ahead and fill this stuff out. What is the password parameter? That's that secret key. What username found with Hydra starts with an M? Murphy, I bet. <laughs> It'll eventually get it. What is the what is the password found with Hydra? Um, so I haven't used Hydra too extensively. Five valid passwords found. So these these are all valid passwords for these accounts. So I I think we can log in as all these different accounts. So we have rooted not rooted. We compromise Peanut Butter M, Davies J, Gongo H, Murphy F, and Jeffers D. So that's cool. Um, we should probably save that. So we could, I wonder if with Hydra, you could actually output it to a file itself instead of manually doing it like I'm doing it now. But let's just go ahead and CD to mail and we'll call it compromised. We'll just call it compromised.txt save that there so we have that information and what is the password found with hydra so that's for merch vf at summer 2020 perfect so gone fishing we're gonna do some fishing we'll probably log in as one of those compromised accounts and do fishing um, i'm just looking at discord real quick gabriel 111 said try to Try to log in on my Twitch if for some reason it's not letting me. I hope next time I can make on time. Uh, well, Gabriel, if you're here right now, I wasn't on time because I spent like the first 30 minutes troubleshooting the VPN because the network wasn't working. So it is all good. Let me, I realize I closed the stream here. Let me get this pulled to my second monitor so I can watch the chat. All right, I didn't miss anything. Cool. Okay, gone fishing. <clears throat> We now need to investigate the mail server. We have a guest account on the mail server. However, the only information we can gather from it is a contact list of employees and emails, which we can use for phishing, of course. And there are different tools out there. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pause this and just show you guys a real world tool that I found really interesting. If I can remember kind of where I did it. Was it Harvester? Gosh, come on, OneNote. Quit failing me. There, there's a cool tool. Is it British Credentials? No, that's not what we're doing. Discovering email addresses this is what I was thinking of. So if you were doing a phishing attack, which obviously I don't recommend, like don't actually do a phishing attack on a company, but if you are a pen tester or just want a proof of concept to understand how some of this works, Let's, I think hunter.io is a decent website. And I want to show you how an attacker would do this. So if we do a company like nsa.gov, they're probably going to come after me right now. Um, you'll notice that we, <laughs> Edward Snowden, that's cool. Um, it's going to kind of go through the internet and web scrape and see what we can find for that. If you create a free account, you can see we can not cover email addresses. They're some of these are free. Let's try phonebook.cz. Yeah, let's try this. So um, it gives us some examples. So we can do netflix.com and submit. And look at that. We have all these probably valid emails that we can then use this. Maybe if we find a directory online, we can use this as part of a phishing attack. There's other websites that can verify if the email is legit. So right here, you can verify email addresses discovered to verify that they are valid without interacting with the person or company you are verifying. And I bet you could probably use an API and put um, that list in 
like a text file and write a script. And then you have like, here are the valid emails. You could use these emails to maybe look through LinkedIn and do other open source intelligence to plan a phishing attack. Uh, so that's just how easy it is to harvest emails for phishing attacks. Just showing that what we're doing here is realistic. Um, these are real methods used by attackers. Okay. With a list of emails, we can send out a phishing campaign to see if any employees execute a malicious payload. Phishing overview. I don't, I, th I think you probably know what phishing is. So we'll just kind of skim through this. Uh, phishing is a broad topic, brief look, attaching an EXE to an email, granting us a reverse shell. There's actually a zero day out right now. And once again, I'll show you guys a real example of this. I think, yes, we have we have a work workaround for this. You can look this up yourself, but it's a zero day vulnerability that can use malicious like Word documents that you don't even have to like enable macros or anything. By simply opening the Word document, it's a one click phishing attack that you can then execute something malicious on the user. So once again, this is real world stuff. Um, granted this reverse cell, this can be done using MS of, MSF Venom to create the payload. I'm sure we'll talk more about that as the course goes on, as well as with other tools along with MSF Venom to obfuscate the payload. That's just to make the payload so you can't tell that it's a payload that can sometimes evade different antivirus detection depending on how they detect it. Identifying targets. Before we send out phishing emails, we first need to identify our targets since we have a specific goal in mind. This is what spear phishing technically is. We want to target employees that throw back hacks. Uh, we can find employees from the contact list of the guest account that we compromised earlier when enumerating web servers. We can also send emails from the guest account. And if we look at that production server, we can take the emails we found, compare them to the team on the production server, and then we know how we can target each individual. Payloads 101. The Metasploit framework is a massive suite of tools that we're only going to scratch a surface of with this course. In this section, we're going to focus on generating payloads using MSF Venom, but before we dive into generating payloads, we need to learn a little more about the types of payloads. Staged and stageless payloads, differentiating between staged and stageless, ah, staged and stageless payloads can be difficult at first. It sounds and seems really complex until you learn the difference between the two. So let's dive into them. Staged payloads require a handler to catch the payload and send the appropriate response back to the server to trigger your reverse shell. Stageless payloads do not require any specific handler, right? So that's the difference between the two. A reverse shell can be caught with a utility like Netcat, SoCat, or many others. Difference in stage versus stageless payloads. Telling the difference between stage and stageless payload in MSF Venom is relatively trivial. First, you need to list all the available payload with MSF Venom using one of the following commands. And let's just go ahead and follow along. The output can be overwhelming. MSF Venom has upwards of 500 plus payloads that you can utilize. Piping the command into grep and narrowing down your search by operating system can majorly reduce the amount. So let's go ahead and do this because I can already tell this is taking a while. So MSF Venom dash L for list payloads and grep, which is essentially like finding. If you remember, we're doing PowerShell. It's kind of like piping. It's a little bit different, but it's similar in the essence that we're taking the output of this grep. We're searching through that output to find something specific for this. We're going to grep windows because that's the OS that the workstations are going to be on that we're targeting tail dash n dot 20, I think is going to show the last 20, I think. And apparently it's going to take some time. So let's just keep reading while that does its thing. And the screenshot above, you notice two similar looking payloads. Windows X64 shell reverse TCP. X64 is, of course, the architecture. Reverse TCP. It did it right here. Spawn a pipe command shell. There it's staged, right? So if you remember, the stage is what requires a handler. Uh, connect back to the attacker. Then we have this one that looks almost identical. Windows X64 uh, shell underscore reverse underscore TCP connect back to attacker and spawn a command shell so this be a stageless. 
There's a minor difference between the two. Whoops. The top payload is stage payload, as stated by the description, but Metasploit also has a naming convention. The top payload has three slashes, one, two, three, which indicate it's a stage payload. Didn't know that. That's why it's going to read through stuff even if you think you know what you're talking about. The bottom payload, which is stageless, has two slashes. Additionally, the bottom payload has two underscores while the top payload only has one. If you notice that. Knowing Metasploit's naming convention on stage versus stageless payload, we already know we will be using the Windows Meterpreter Reverse TCP payload. So that has two. So if we follow kind of that reasoning, the two is going to be a stageless one, right? If we follow that reasoning or stage, I don't know. Um, to generate a payload before, we should take the time to verify. We can do this by listing MSF Venom's payload and grep for the prior mentioned payload. So let's go ahead and just follow along with the guide. MSF Venom dash L for list payloads. And there's that grep command I talked about. We're looking for a string windows meterpreter reverse underscore TCP. And it should pull it out for us. Okay, confirming Windows, blah, blah, is a staged payload. The description does not indeed indicate that it is a staged payload. I don't know why mine's taking so long. After we generate the payload, we'll set up our handler that will be used to catch our shell. So we can do like we did for the reverse shell. We can set up a netcat handler to do that. Here it is. Inject the interpreter server DL via the payload stage, blah, blah, blah. Okay. All interpreter payloads will require a handler no matter what. Which payload where? So far, stageless payloads sound like the best payloads to use for any given task, right? Well, no, that's not always the case. Stageless payloads by design are larger. They're larger, so keep that in mind. Stageless equals larger because they contain everything required to land a reverse shell back on your box in a nice and neat style. This can be a disadvantage for several reasons, which are reasons that you would want to use a stage payload for. There are several reasons you might want to use a stage payload. For example, number one, you could use it when you're limited on space in a SEH based buffed buffer overflow or stack based buffer overflow. Buffer overflows just confuse me. We'll just throw that out there. Maybe we'll get some practice. You could use it in conjunction with antivirus evasion techniques to sleep for a given period of time to escape a sandbox and malware scans that might detect your payload. Interesting. Afterwards, reach out to your handler for the rest of the payload. Additionally, you can also use stage payloads to gain additional functionality within your shell like Meterpreter and is the, the biggest reason that you would want to use a stage payload. Note, even with some stageless payloads, to get certain features like Meterpreter to work, you will need a handler. Because remember, they said any Meterpreter shell is going to need a handler. If you're going to set up a handler anyways, you might as well make it a stage payload, right? Right. Generating payloads. In this portion of the course, we will be using a stage Meterpreter payload due to its additional functionality. In order to generate our payload, we can use MSF Venom with dash P to select our payload, followed by L host. That's going to be our IP, our listening host variable, and an L port. That's the port we're listening on. So if you remember our PHP shell that we did before, similar thinking. Remember, we set our IP in that PHP shell in the port we wanted, 1337, that example, in that pay shell, or in the PHP reverse shell, to tell MSF Venom what interface and port to listen on. Lastly, we'll follow up with the .f flag to tell MS of Venom what format we would like the shell code to be in. We will be using exe for this example. Um, I believe you can even use like PDF or different things like that to make it if you're doing a true phishing email, most people aren't going to open a .exe. Or for the zero day, a .docx, you know, a word file. Putting this all together, we can get a nice command that looks like so. All right, well, let's go ahead and see if we can do that. MSF Venom dash P for payload. We're specifying the payload that we worked on. TCP L host. Um, we could probably use ton zero. Let's double check. Yep, we could. Okay, cool. And I should just point out what I was looking at. Um, this is the IP we need. And we have it there. So we'll follow along. Zero L port. Now, the reason it has 53 
is that's going to be a common port, so it could be used for firewall evasion. Meterpreter often defaults to the port 4444. And if you look at just standard firewall rules, they will often block that port because it's a known port for exploitation. So it's always good practice to use a common port. Now, you can't evade what's called the layer 7 firewall this way because a layer 7 firewall, it's following the OSI layer, which means the firewall is application aware. Even if you're using like port 53 or port 80 to make it look like HTTP traffic, the firewall actually looks into that traffic and says, hey, these aren't standard get requests and it's going to be blocked. Okay. So this won't evade all firewalls, but it will evade firewalls that are not like that layer 7 firewall. L port 53 dash F for our format is exe dash O is going to be how we want it to output. And of course we'll call it not a shell dot exe because you know, obviously you'd click that, right? Because I'm, I'm telling you it's not a shell. It may take a few moments for the payload to generate. After it's finished, you'll receive some statistics about the generated payload. Congratulations, you've successfully generated a payload. We haven't yet because it's still loading. Next up is getting your handler set up to catch the payload. Metasploit, now let's just see. There we have it, not a shell.exe. Clearly no one would ever recognize that that is a reverse shell. We, we're, we're definitely gonna trick them in our phishing attack. Metasploit makes setting up handlers incredibly easy. Now I will just note, um, I I know Nate is as well studying for the OSCP and you're limited on what you can use Metasploit for. I don't know if you can use it to catch a payload. Nate, you can confirm or deny that. I know in the OSCP generally you can use Metasploit once. You can pick one box to use Metasploit on and everything else has to be manual enumeration. But our handler could just as easily be an NCAT listener, and it should accomplish the same thing, but you'd be limited because it wouldn't be a full interpreter shell, but you could still catch this payload. Um, Nate can confirm or decline in the chat, and if or when he does. Okay, so Nate said, you can use multi-handler to catch shells, if I remember right. Can only use exploit for Metasploit once. Okay, that makes sense. Metasploit makes setting up handlers incredibly easy. After generating your payload, we need to spin up MSF console. So the way that you launch Metasploit is by typing MSF console. Take a drink of water. I've been talking a lot. We're an hour and eight minutes into the stream, my friends. We got 20 minutes or so left. So we'll see how far we get. Um, but like I said, for those of you watching, the four of you, thanks for being on here, or those of you watching on YouTube after the fact, uh, I can't promise every night, but I would say most of the time I will be streaming on Twitch from 10.30 p.m. to midnight central time. I'm already studying at that time, so I figured I might as well stream what I'm learning on my own, and maybe you'll learn something and, and join with me. So we need to spin up MSF console, use the exploit next in the asset, blah, 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 blah. And it actually shows everything that we're using here. I want to show you guys before we do this, I want to show you a little bit about how uh, Metasploit works. So Metasploit is, as it sounds, a program used for hacking. You can exploit known vulnerabilities this way. You can actually look them up by their CVE. You can look them up by the program. So for example, I'm just trying to think of like Apache, for example. We can search Apache, and it's gonna pull up the different vulnerabilities. I'm gonna full screen this because it will look a little neater, or it should. Let me shut again. Yeah, so if we look through Apache, you'll notice it, it puts it in different categories. So we have exploits, we have scanners here, um, but if you know like the Apache version, you can look up at what is it vulnerable to. And then if we want to use, just kind of looking through here, we can just pick a random one. Um, hey, there's log for shell, that's a popular one. So let's go ahead and that was 83. So you would do use 83. And then you can check your options and it's gonna tell you everything that it needs. So for this one, we need the HTTP header to inject into, the method, the port, 
um, the R host, that's going to be the IP that we're attacking. The port that we're attacking server host is often the one on your attack machine to listen on, the local port to listen on. Here we have the L host L port to set up a, sh a reverse shell through Java. So I'm not going to go too deep into uh, Metasploit, but I will say if you're on Try Hack Me, I believe they have an entire module dedicated to Metasploit that walks you through how to use Mod Metasploit, how to set up different payloads, how to go through these different things. But for now, let's go back to just following our room right here and pull this up. And let's go ahead and just give ourselves a little more room on our Kali Linux box. So we're going to use exploit multi handler make this a little clearer. So if we look at options here, you're going to see the options that we're going to set. Um, but we also need to set the payload. So we already checked the payload before when we were grepping through stuff. So let's go ahead and set our payload for Windows, interpreter, reverse TCP. And then let's set our L port. So this is what I was saying. If you remember what I said before, interpreter often uses port 4444 for the L port. And we need to match, as, as we're setting this up, we need to match what we specified and the payload that we set earlier. So if I remember right, in our payload, we set the L port to 53, set L host to ton zero. And now we're gonna exploit dash J. Let me just clear this out. Let's check our options one more time. Make sure we have everything right. And now what this is doing is it's doing the same thing our Netcat listener did before. It's just going to be listening. And then what it's listening for, we're listening for our victim to run our not a shell.exe. And when they run that shell, what should happen is it should connect back to this um, handler to catch that shell. And then we have pwned them. That's how it's supposed to work anyways. So exploit... So there we go. We started it. This is our attack IP and we're on port 53. So catching some fish, let's create our phishing email. All right. Creating an effective phishing email may appear daunting at first. Um, and let's just be real. If you ever look at your phishing emails, I should pull up one of my old emails and we can look at a legit phishing email. There's such bad grammar. Um, everything's terrible. <laughs> But every once in a while, if it's a targeted phishing email, they can get pretty advanced. Creating an effective phishing email may appear daunting at first. However, we'll see that this requires only a cursory understanding of social engineering and the basics of business email composition. And might I suggest the basics of English grammar. Consider this. We have two goals with phishing attacks. Goal one, stay under our target's radar, such as that the email does not come across as suspicious. And two, prompt our target into action through either filling out some form or through the execution of our payload. And I've seen this in the real world where uh, when I worked in IT support, people would forward emails to me that were supposed to phishing emails. Many of them actually were. And it'd be like a Google form. Like, hey, to access this document, type in your username and password in a Google form, but people actually fell for it. This requires us to write an email that has the following. Number one, correct grammar and punctuation. Thank you. Uh, prompts a user to action. Uh, three sets a deadline for action. We we want to make it urgent, like do this now or this dire consequence is going to happen and make sense within the business context. Here's a brief example of what might constitute an effective phishing email. Hey, everyone, we're releasing an update for our note-taking software in order to keep using the software. So we have this, like, it, it makes sense in the business world to do this. In order to keep using the software, this is time specific. You must, you must perform this update prior to next Friday. Please run the attached file, not a shell.exe, to this email to complete this action. Thank you for your patience in this update, IT support. Note how we accomplish our goals in providing a situation wherein the email not only makes sense to our target, but also prompts them into action with a set deadline. If you successfully created a payload and send out a convincing email, enough email, you may get lucky and an employee will click on your attachment and execute your payload. Sending phishing emails to all employees that throw back hacks and wait a couple minutes to see if you get back a shell. Okay, so let's first back up here and let's log in as one of the users that we compromised to make it even more believable. Um, let's, I, if I remember it asked about the Murphy F guy, so Murphy F in summer 2020, let's go ahead and log in as Murphy F 
summer 2020. And look at that. Um, just click through this stuff. Please open the file attached below in order to carry out essential vulnerability updates. That's funny. So is this, is this from another user on the network? I mean, the date's wrong. From, from guess. So this is someone trying to do a phishing campaign, right? And they have the vulnerability update.exe here. That's cool. Um, let's just jump back. I want to look through a few of these. And we have a password reset notification. Dear Frank Murphy, due to the recent firing of the TimeKeep developer who had access to our database, we have decided to issue a password reset. You can do so by replacing username. So um, I just want you guys to look at this. The password reset was sent on August of 10 of 2020. That's, of course, summertime, and this password is summer 2020. That's why if you are a system admin, you need to enforce password complexity and you can actually there, there's different things you can download i think no before has this where you can connect it to your active directory and they'll actually scan through your active directory hashes and compare them to compromised hashes and tell you which users are using compromised passwords so um some cool stuff that you can do there let's jump back we are going to want to send out our phishing email so let's go ahead and do that let's compose or actually let's go to addresses can we Oh, our address book is empty. Are we supposed to do this from guest? I mean, it'd be more convincing if we did it from an actual user, but guest had everybody in the email address and I don't feel like um, typing in their name. So we're gonna log back in as guest, but if this is a real world situation and you had compromised people's emails, you definitely would wanna use their emails and not guest. This is also another reason why multi-factor authentication is so important. If you're at a company, you may get annoyed that when you log into your email or other applications, you have to pull your phone out because you have Microsoft Authenticator or whatever and you have to confirm the login. This is why that's important. Passwords are easily compromised, but if you have that second layer of defense, um, it's gonna help prevent that so that even if your password is compromised, an attacker cannot log into your email because you're gonna receive that multi-factor authentication. Now there's ways to bypass that. One way is social engineering, right? So if I'm talking to Nate, for example, and let's pretend like Nate doesn't know anything about computers and I call him and I'm like, hey, Nate, uh, this is so-and-so. Once again, social engineering, figure out a name from, this is John from the IT support department. We are troubleshooting some stuff with your email. In just a few minutes, you're going to receive a prompt on your phone. Hey, can you just do me a favor and confirm that for me? Oh, you can? Okay, sweet. Thank you. I appreciate it. So you can use social engineering, among other things, to bypass multi-factor authentication, but it is kind of just a standard you should have in place. If your company doesn't do that now, you are just asking for trouble. So let's go ahead and go to our addresses. Let's get all of our people, and let's do compose to. Let's call this subject uh, check out... Tyler's Twitch <laughs> stream. It's awesome. Obviously, that does not actually fit the phishing email, but hi, everyone. I recently came across this incredible streamer. He does a great job at providing cybersecurity aware, the cybersecurity awareness training. Please open the attached file to automatically, I think it's follow, follow his Twitch stream so you can watch his next stream. Thanks. IT support. Okay. I think that sounds like a good phishing email. Um, now what we need to do is, of course, attach our not a shell shell and that was in throwback mail not a shell do i need to hit attach afterwards yep okay so Hey everyone, I recently came across this incredible streamer. He does a great job of providing cybersecurity awareness training. Please open the attached file to automatically follow his Twitch stream so you can watch his next stream. Thanks, IT support. Send. Okay. Um, let's see if it went through. 
that it did. We have it right there. It has the attachment. Let's jump back to this. Uh, did we miss anything here? If you have six secure preload, send out send out convincing enough email, you may get lucky, blah, blah, blah. What user was compromised via phishing? Uh, I don't know. So this is running, right? Yeah, okay. I never use exploit dash J. I don't know what dash J dot does. Usually if you just run exploit, it keeps running here. Um, I thought maybe it opened a session. Oh, it runs as background job zero. Um, how do I even check that? Hey, Nate, how do you check that? <laughs> Usually I just do exploit. I don't really know what the dash J tag does, but we're gonna find out. Oh, it just does jobs, okay, gotcha. Oh, dude, you're a genius. So if we do job zero, does that allow us to connect to it? Oh, let's see. How do we connect to our interpreter? Okay, here we go. Displays and manages jobs, right? Which is if we just type jobs, we got that. Jobs just run, you can't connect. Okay, gotcha. Oh, so there we go. We're getting a connection right there. So a user clicked our not a shell dot exe and we should get a interpreter se session one open. So here's where the sessions come in place. This is what I was trying to do initially. Oh. We are root. Oh, maybe they're a local admin on their account. So if we type shell, I thought we'd, oh, here, here's our, here's our information right there. Blair J was our person compromised. What machine was compromised during phishing? And we can see we're at workstation one, throwback workstation 01. And look at that. It is 1151. I honestly think this is probably a good stopping point. I'm just going to glance ahead at this one. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, although it's not quite midnight, I think this is a good spot to stop. Let's go to our sessions one. LS. Okay. Let, is there any, I bet there's some flags we can grab real quick before we call it a day. What is the flag from the poison user on throwback.prod? So now we could we could keep it at Meterpreter or we could drop into a shell. I'm gonna drop into a shell just to show you guys how that works. Meterpreter is more powerful. We drop into a shell. Now we're in a Windows shell, right? So we could do dir, and I'm guessing it might be, I think they often put the flags on their desktop or documents, I don't remember. There it is, so if we cat root, no, it's not cat, it's uh, type root.txt in Windows, if I remember right. We have a flag right there. Let's grab that. Oh, one of these is a flag. <laughs> oh, hold up. I was looking at throwback production. We haven't, we haven't done that yet. So what is the user flag? What is the root flag? Here's what we found. Is that right there? What is the user flag on throwback WS01? We're already root, so I don't know. Let's go back to C users what other users do we have here we have fox r horseman b i don't know let's just look at a few of these not that one not that one 
One of these has to have it, right? Hey. And type is just like the Windows equivalent of cat. If you're wondering why I'm doing type. If you don't work in the command shell much for Windows. Okay, I think those are the two flags for compromising that workstation. So we're going to call it a night, y'all. Thank you for joining me. For those of you watching on YouTube, thank you for watching on YouTube. Um, I encourage you to catch me uh, next time live for this stream. Once again, I will be streaming most of the time from 10.30 p.m. to midnight. Hopefully next time I won't spend the first 30 minutes troubleshooting why the throwback network isn't working. But as you can see, just to recap kind of what we've done, we got that web shell again. We got some information from being root on the firewall. And uh, we ended up pivoting over to the mail server. We used Hydra, remember, to essentially get do password spraying. And we compromised, I think, around five users through password spraying. And then we created a, a payload with MSF Venom. It did a phishing email campaign. We compromised a user who happened to be root. And then we used that as our pivot point to go through that. We had our interpreter. We dropped down into shell. And then we grabbed these flags. So we will start up at task 13 tomorrow. And I will catch you guys then. For those of you on YouTube, I'm going to stop recording. And now for those of you on Twitch, I'm just going to pull up the chat before I disconnect with you guys. Um, thanks for joining. Special thank you to Nate for hanging along and helping me <laughs> as we work our way through this. And my plan is to, let's see, what day is it tomorrow? Thursday. I think I'll probably be live tomorrow. Um, pretty sure I will be. So if I'm not live at 1030, I'm not going to be, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm free again tomorrow night. So I'll likely be back on Twitch at 1030 tomorrow night, and we will keep working our way through the throwback network. And I will catch you guys then. Hey, thank you, Jose. Appreciate it. See you guys later.